Jimmy Savile was a paedophile who spent years in the spotlight but always hid his darkest secret. But towards the end of his life, after decades of abusing children, journalists were asking tentative questions. The press sometimes have a field day with you. They're looking for the dirt in Jimmy Savile. And they've, I'm never, sorry, sure and they've never, ever found it. There isn't any. I'm very boring. Any, <laughs> any, any tabloid journalist will tell you two things. One, I'm very boring. I don't do drugs, I don't do any sex, I don't do any of them things that they print in papers today. But they still like coming down to talk to me. Even if journalists were thrown off the trail, some organisations working with Savile heard enough. Well, how lovely to how see lovely you. How lovely, my child. How unexpected, if I may say. Children in Need is a landmark BBC event. Every year, tens of millions of pounds are raised for good causes. An ideal venture for fundraising impresario to Savile. Sorry, tell us. So, uh, the Radio 1 initiative test in aid of children in need. Yeah. Our listeners can phone in and pledge money for their favourite team. Jimmy, are you looking forward to this? I'm looking forward to it like you can't believe this is the apex of my career. But his appearances were stopped after 1999 by a then BBC governor. The body language of the staff when Jimmy Savile was mentioned uh, was such that I could uh, detect discomfort and I came to the view that um, they didn't really want him uh, involved and I didn't want him involved either. Jones's intervention is crucial because it demonstrates that some major figures, even in the BBC, were not fooled by Savile. But he never told anyone at the corporation about his decision. You were aware, or you would have been aware, that Jimmy Savile was still high profile, still involved very much in children's work. Did that not concern you? No. No, because uh, I was responsible for that which I was responsible for. I was not responsible for the rest of it. I, other people, producers and such like, you know, they had that responsibility. If they uh, wanted to do something different, fine. But surely, having made a big decision that you made to not have him involved in children in need, it was for you to tell other people, let them make their own decision, but let them have that knowledge. If you haven't got proof, then they would say, I'm sorry, you know, uh, not substantiated. I would have lost. I would have been made to look ridiculous. But what I have a problem with yeah. is the fact that you've made that decision on a gut feeling, which is entirely right, but you didn't pass that on to anybody else. You didn't even tell them, this is a decision I've made. It's entirely up to you what you do with it, but I need to tell you. Potentially, from that one conversation, you could have opened up a complete can of worms and he could have stopped from offending against children because what the likelihood is is he continued to offend after that period of time. Well, um, hindsight is truly a wonderful thing. Um, I didn't even know if I was right or not. But you are, you now know. I, I now know. But as I said, hindsight is a wonderful thing. It gives a 20-20 vision. And, you know, with that, I... Knowing now what you know, that this was a dangerous predatory period. I'd have made, I think, I think I would have made a, um, uh, a much uh, bigger fuss and impact uh, um, with the BBC. But as I said, that's hindsight. The corporation says it's horrified by recent events and it has apologised for its part. Two investigations have now started to ensure it never happens again. But the BBC is not the only institution he might have stopped Savile. After more than 40 years of criminal behaviour, he had left enough clues to trigger several police investigations. Between 1980 and 2008, there were four police inquiries into Savile, but he never faced justice, a source of frustration for children's campaigners. I think the wishes of all the people that we've spoken to, that, that Savile was alive today, that he would be put through the courts and he would receive the appropriate punishment. I know from experience that child abuse investigations are very complex and difficult to manage. Fundamental to their success is getting traumatised victims to give detailed accounts. This was particularly tough with Savile. He chose his victims carefully, targeting young vulnerable people who would be afraid to speak out. And according to his confidant of 28 years, he was totally ruthless in dealing with anyone who crossed him. If somebody was going to say something about him, uh, 
whether it was in a professional capacity or a journalistic capacity, he would say, um, if you do that, I will make you very, very famous. And I used to remember seeing this guy happen. And, uh, well, of course, by then I'd learned what he meant. He was going to expose them in the newspaper or say something detrimental about them in the newspaper. This aggressive approach might have overwhelmed many potential accusers. But in 2007, Surrey Police had perhaps the best chance to get him. They began an investigation following a report of an indecent assault by Savile at Duncross School in the late 1970s. The school catered for intelligent girls who were deemed troubled. Exposure has already revealed that two ex-pupils claim to have been abused by Savile. Fiona told us she was sexually assaulted by him in his car. I was with him on my own in the back of the car and I knew the moment he asked me to stay in the car with him what was expected of me. Surrey police contacted 20 former residents of Duncroft and met with Bernardo's who at the time of the allegation were managing the school. They also liaised with other police forces none of whom reported any allegations about Savile. They developed their case sufficiently over two years to interview Savile under caution on the 1st of October 2009. At least three allegations of sexual abuse were put to him. Savile denied all the offences. The police sent the file to the Crown Prosecution Service. They ruled there was insufficient evidence to charge Savile. This decision has been criticised as a missed opportunity, but child abuse investigators say Savile's high profile has made him a tough target. One of the features of the Savile case is that he had a huge aura of celebrity around him, and I have no doubt that that will have affected uh, the sense in which people felt uh, brave enough or courageous enough to come forward, affected their confidence that they would be believed if they did, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. People exercise power and um, that's, that celebrity is a form of power. The decision not to charge is now being reviewed by the Director of Public Prosecutions, although an internal review has already concluded the right decision was made. But questions have been raised about the work of Surrey Police. The force says officers decided not to interview any Duncroft staff members because Bernardo's had told them they had no record of any sexual abuse, nor had any former residents said staff witnessed or were aware of any instance. But should they have at least spoken to the school's headmistress, Margaret Jones? Hello. Hello, Margaret. It's Mark here. She told me she would have been very keen to help. You weren't spoken to by Surrey Police? Well, I've got to be right. I never have been spoken to. You've never been spoken to at all? Yeah, I should have been told he was interviewed. Jones, who is now 90, says she did not witness any abuse by Savile, nor did she have any suspicions. But had they spoken to her, Surrey Police might have learned crucial details about Savile's visits. Did he take any of the girls out in his car? I'm not going to say anything. You're not going to say anything? I couldn't say anything wrong. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. For the record, I was an officer at Surrey Police for 12 years. But the scale of Savile's offending and the failure to bring him to justice has led some figures to call this a watershed moment for child abuse. Never again must victims feel they can't come forward. And there are signs this is happening. Since our first investigation, the NSPCC has been handling a dramatic rise in calls, and not only in relation to Savile. Well, since uh, your programme, we've doubled the number of referrals regarding sexual abuse coming to our helpline, so that's, you know, a 100% increase on that. That's quite significant. We've had a 60% increase on people who are seeking advice about concerns that they might have regarding children who might be a victim to sexual abuse or have historically been abused as children. Before I finish my investigation, I have one final letter from the Savile Archives, which I want to return to sender. In 1996, children's campaigner Esther Ransom wrote to Savile, thanking him for his contribution to a book for her charity Childline. Esther has done decades of work for children, and she finds the letter galling just makes me feel that he deceived me and fooled me the way he fooled everybody else over the years. And it uh, doesn't surprise me because that's what paedophiles have to do. 
You know, they always say monsters don't get near children, nice men do. And it's only by making this sort of image for himself he could get near children. But I am fascinated that this is the only thing he ever did for Childline. And what I'm wondering is if only a child had rung us as a result of this book and told us what he was doing to them, we could have passed that to the police. We could have done so much good. In a sense, an opportunity missed. Esther believes the Savile scandal must be a turning point for child abuse allegations. And she's calling for changes in how victims are treated in court. The law at the moment doesn't protect children. What we need to do is, as a first step, we have to stop cross-examining children in open court. The cross-examination, if it has to happen, should happen in judges' chambers. I have witnessed a little girl being told she was lying 13 times by a defence barrister. I know they regard it as their duty to break down the credibility of the child however they can. And that just about winds us up for this week. Jimmy Savile, possibly the most prolific child abuser on police record. A celebrity who escaped detection by hiding in the spotlight. Even now, we don't know the full picture of his crimes. But can we be sure history won't repeat itself? The victims will be heard and believed and ensure that abuse on the scale perpetrated by Jimmy Savile can never happen again. Anyone affected by the issues raised in this programme can contact the NSPCC helpline on 0808 800 5000 or their local police force. You can also find further information at itv.com forward slash exposure.